starting late today. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the July 29th uh, midday meeting of the Ro Rotary Club of Rochester. I'm Audrey Betcher, the your president um, of your club. So I'm going to lead us in the four-way. <laughs> I'm going to lead us in the four-way test um, of all the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. And Colin will lead us in a reflection. Thank you. President Roger. Okay, I'll just lean down. It's easier. Uh, so today, that was not easy. That's maybe better. Is that better? Uh, in thinking about the reflection that I signed up for last evening. So this morning at work, I Googled the reflections for Rotary, and I got an eight page inspirational reflections for Rotary meetings. So if anyone wants so, to sign up. So if I can do this, you can do this. In fact, I'll give you this after I'm done today. So I'm just picking one of 16 pages. Um, ageless quotes. And these are from people ages 6 to 48. And I thought, well, that does apply. There are some people in this room age 6 to 48. I learned that I like I like my teacher because she cries when we sing Silent Night. I learned that our dog doesn't want to eat my broccoli either. That's a seven-year-old. <laughs> I've learned that just when I get my room the way I like it, my mother makes me clean it up again. And they actually give the age of these people just as a 12-year-old. I've learned that if you want to cheer yourself up, you should try cheering someone else up. I've learned that although it's hard to admit it, I'm secretly glad my parents are strict with me. I've learned that silent company is often more healing than words of advice. Uh, and these actually these sayings, the age of this person gets older as we reach 48. I've learned that brushing my child's hair is one of life's greatest pleasures. I've learned that wherever I go, the world's worst drivers had followed me there also. <laughs> I have learned that if someone says something unkind about me, I must try to live my life so that no one will believe it. I have learned that you can make someone's day by simply sending them a little note. I have learned that the greatest, that the greater a person's sense of guilt, the greater his or her need to cast blame on others. Some of these you just got to slow down a click. I learned that children and grandparents are natural allies. <laughs> I, have, I have a story about that. Yeah. I learned that if you want to do something positive for your children, work to improve your marriage. I think that's a good thing. All right, so the last section, ages 49 to 85. And I know there are some 49 to 85-year-olds in this group, and that's the group I fall in. I learned that no matter what happens or how bad it seems today, life goes on and it will be better tomorrow. I've learned that singing Amazing Grace can lift my spirits for hours. 
I've learned that motel mattresses are better on the side away from the phone. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that. I have learned that you can tell a lot about a man by the way he handles these three things a rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree lights. <laughs> All right, last I learned that keeping a vegetable garden is worth more than a medicine cabinet full of pills. I've learned that regardless of your relationship with your parents, you miss them terribly after they die. I can echo that statement. I have learned that making a living is not the same as making a life. I have learned that sometimes you, sometimes I've learned that life sometimes gives you a second chance. I have learned that if you pursue happiness, it will elude you. But if you focus on your family, the needs of others, your work, meeting new people, and doing the very best you can, happiness will find you. Maybe that's the definition of rotary. I learned that whenever I decide something with kindness, I usually make the right decisions. I have learned that when I have pains, I don't have to be one. <laughs> I thought that was right there. Okay, last one. I have learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone. Wasn't that an AT&T ad? Reach out and touch someone? I think there was something in America that was reach out and touch somebody. People love that human touch, holding hands, a warm hug, or just a friendly pat on the back. <laughs> All right, thanks. And Allie is going to introduce our guest today. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You gotta get right in there, Alan. All right. It's very directional. I remember all the years that I've been in Rotary, 24, uh, admiring the people who could get up and tell a joke and go around and feel so uncomfortable. And I didn't do any lessons about this, but I did have the pleasure of meeting three people today, one of whom is our guest uh, speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Jessica Sun from Channel One. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation. And I've been in this club long enough and I should have figured it out. She looked awfully familiar. Uh, Cheryl Barlow is here. She was a former member of our club and, and I just was going to let her make a, a kind of a short snap of, of, of her rotary involvement. No. <laughs> I am Cheryl Marlow. I'm actually a member of the Rotary Club of Tallahassee right now, where I reside. And I was a member of this club several years ago, but moved to Tallahassee. Our biggest fundraiser is our most student poets, where we take a Rotarian from poets. Oh, my. And uh, it's a pretty good fundraiser. We net about 40,000 in composition and at the end of COVID. Thank you. Welcome. And Robert Flanders, who was our uh, guest last week, and he's back again. Just for those who weren't here, I'm from Stan, Virginia, but I guess I now live in Rochester. Um, so I experienced my first trip to the uh, licensing. Uh, <laughs> my uh, son uh, is getting his, uh, well, he made his first attempt to, to get his uh, driver's permit yesterday. So. Uh, and I, I spoke to a neighbor about this, and he said, well, it's, it's nothing. You should try to get a driver's license in California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome back. Are there any other guests? Anybody else? Okay. Well, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Yes, Jessica. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jessica Sun. I'm All right, uh, birthdays. We have Colin who will have a birthday tomorrow. I have to make sure I know what day of today is. Uh, Lori Carroll is tomorrow. Mark Ostrom is tomorrow. Steve Sponsel is tomorrow. Betty Devine is July 31st. Chris Colby will be August 1st. Uh, Lance Orkelson will be August 3rd. Michaela Schmidt is August 6th. 
Um, and for anniversaries, we have Steve Nymos is four years and Kerwin Engelhart is 23 years. Let's celebrate these birthdays and anniversaries. <laughs> Uh, so next week we have um, we have our Rotary After Hours, which is going to resume, and uh, we'll be meeting right at the corner at the library on you can park at the the Civic Center ramp, and we're going to walk over and enjoy uh, Thursdays downtown together as a as a group. So uh, meeting at five thirty, um, and again park free parking at the Civic Center ramp and meeting at the corner of the library right there by the ramp. Um, I would, I'm would. i also gonna encourage people, it's still not too late to sign up for the honkers tonight. Um, I I heard a rumor that they hadn't necessarily called you back. If, so, if you put in the, they're in the, sorry, in the moccasin flower, there is a, a link to sign up and you fill in your information and they call you back. I will just tell you that I just called them and let me give you the phone number for anybody who wants that phone number. You can just call and order the tickets over the, over the phone and then they'll be at will call tonight. And that phone number is 507-289-1170 for anybody who wants to do that. Or you can still go onto the link and put your information in. But if you just want to go, you want me that number again, Chris? So you have the number, right? I, uh, I just recently, like uh, 45 minutes ago, tried that number again. Mailbox is full and they said, uh, call back later. Oh dear. Okay. I, I called about 30 minutes ago and somebody answered. So, yeah. I told them the same thing. They said they're having trouble with their mailbox. Yeah. Okay. And so, the other thing is that we get a $5 uh, return as a club uh, For fundraiser. But you have to do it in advance in order to get that those five dollars coming back. Let's include hot dogs. Okay, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have you repeat that for everybody on Zoom. Don't give up on the mailbox issue because I talked to uh, Justin or this, this morning and I left a message yesterday and didn't get a call back and their their voicemail was full. Um, but you need to call. Uh, and you can either go online or call 507-289-1170. And it's $10 uh, per person and we get $5 back. But it needs to be done in advance of the event. So they'll take a credit card over the phone. And looking forward to it, it looks like a nice night. Yeah, perfect night for baseball. So we hope you can join us. Um, our golf outing is planned for the third Thursday in September, which would be September 16th at Northern Valley, and all skill levels are welcome. You don't have to put a fourth together. You can just sign up and we'll, we'll put teams together. You can, if you have people you want to play with, that's fine too. And the sign up is coming soon. Uh, lunch will be out at the clubhouse that day at noon and tea times will start at one. So we hope you can join us for our golf outing. Uh, a reminder to review the draft of the strategic plan. I do appreciate the comments I've gotten so far. So thank you to those who've actually who read it, who read the strategic plan. Uh, I will tell you as someone who uh, really believes in strategic plans, um, when it's approved, we're gonna work on it. So if you don't like what's there, you need to tell us now because we're gonna work on it. <laughs> so. I also want to give a shout out to Lori Ludke, who is who's agreed to take on being the public image chair for the club this year, and I really want to thank her for that. So, <laughs> are there any other announcements before we start the program? Anything? Um, I saw Doug come in. Doug. Doug. What? Did you want to? Did you want to talk at all about the foundation? No, or, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, don't need to put you in the spot. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sorry, Doug. I did not mean to put you on the spot. All right. Um, any announcements? No. All right. All right. So I'm gonna get.
All right. So Jessica Sund is the Director of Development and Communications at Channel One Regional Food Bank in Rochester. She's been with Channel One for three years, uh, but has worked in the nonprofit development sector for over seven years, cultivating her passion for philanthropy uh, and experience in fundraising, donor relations, uh, communications, marketing, and special events. In her previous role with the Boys and Girls Club of Rochester as a development associate, Jessica also led the auction committee of the Boys and Girls Club Gala Chair Affair, increasing auction revenue by an average of 13% each year for three consecutive years. Having lived in Rochester her entire life and raising her daughter there, Jessica is grateful to be in a place where she can work every day toward making her community stronger and healthier. Her top two strengths are adaptability and empathy, which allows her to live life with an adventurous spirit and strong relationships. Jessica. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, a few things off of each table. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to uh, share what Channel One has been up to uh, this past year um, and answer any questions. Get this tightened up here. It was kind of finicky. Slide the mic in the There you go. There we go. Aha. Wonderful. Um, so this is my first time in a Rotary meeting, um, and so I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to again share what our channel one has been up to in the past uh, past year or really 15 months. Um, a lot of you may be very familiar with our work, but for those of you who are not, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick um, overview of our organization and what it is we do. Um, channel One Regional Food Bank. Is I don't know, it, it could have been me. Um, <laughs> the largest hunger relief organization in southeastern Minnesota. As a food bank, we act, uh, act as a hub um, and a sourcer of food and also distribution across 14 counties in southeastern Minnesota, including uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, and then also, uh, we partner with about 183 um, agencies or food shops or food programs across those 14 counties to distribute food um, all across the region to those who are facing food insecurity. Um, one of the flyers that I have given you here um, kind of outlines that a little bit and the top one in 2020, um, kind of the amount of, give you a little bit of idea of the amount of uh, food that we do distribute. Last year we distributed, um, it was about 9 million pounds of food across our region. So it's a massive amount of food. If you have not had a chance to come and visit our facility, I think the warehouse speaks for itself to give you an idea of the scale um, of food that we do distribute. Um, as a food bank, uh, Channel One is a little unique that we also have a food shelf um, on, on site as well. That is kind of uncommon for a food bank, uh, but it's a really innovative um, opportunity for us to better serve the Olmstead County community. So the Channel One uh, food shelf, which is again attached to the food bank, we serve about, on an average, 3,500 to 4,000 households every single month. Um, so that's how many families in uh, Olmstead County are coming to see us to get their groceries. Um, and, and that number has significantly grown, of course, since um, the pandemic began. I'll kind of get into that as well. But again, just kind of a basic overview for those of you who may not be familiar with Channel One's work. Um, we have a few programs also other than the food shelf that Channel One Food Bank um, has. We also offer mobile pantries. Um, and what those do is we will uh, take trucks of food, boxes of food to rural communities who may not have great access to food programs or even great access to grocery stores in general um, and bring that food into the communities so that those, those individuals can access it as well. Those have been extremely successful again, especially in the past 15 months. We also have a, a nutrition assistance program for seniors, uh, which focuses on senior hunger and those who may be forced to make diff difficult decisions um, um, as they have to choose between medications, medical bills, um, rent, and of course, food. Um, no one should have to make those decisions. So of course, we're happy to work with this community in different high rises to make sure that these folks also have plenty of food to, to uh, subsequent their, their, their needs. Um, and then also we have the um, childhood hunger programs. This one is near and dear to our heart. We work with um, Rochester Public Schools um, and, and some other schools in our counties um, to uh, 
to have school pantries on site in a lot of these schools, but also um, operate our backpack program. Um, the backpack program is designed to identify children who are facing food insecurity in our community. Um, we have great partnerships with Russia Public Schools, um, a lot of teachers to help identify um, students who may be coming to school um, with behavioral problems or they're tired and a lot of times um, the solution is that they're hungry and then they're not getting the nutrition that they need. So the backpack program provides uh, packs of food for these children to take home over the weekends to help um, again, get them the food that they need over the weekend um, until they get back into the schools, which is unfortunately sometimes um, some of the only meals that they get throughout the day. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of sums up our, our programs. If you have questions about that, um, let me know. Um, I'll kind of get into what we've been up to the past 15 months. Um, and of course, that's going to touch on all of these programs and, and things that we've have been doing. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go way back. We're going to go all the way back to March. And don't worry, I won't take up 45 minutes, even though I probably could, um, talking about what we've been up to. Um, but when this all started in March, uh, it was a scary time for all of us. Um, Channel One had to make a lot of very difficult decisions. Um, one of those being that we had to close the doors of our food shelf to operate a drive up model only. Now what that looked like um, was a little sad for us because we really pride ourselves on a choice model for our shoppers. Um, it's very important that our shoppers can come in and choose the food that's important to them. And so that was a really hard decision for us, uh, but we decided for the safety of our staff, volunteers, and of course our shoppers and clients that we needed to close those doors um, and we would uh, go ahead and pre-pack boxes, emergency food boxes, and distribute those through drive up models. Um, with that decision also came um, a little bit more cost. It's, it's a higher cost model to operate safely like that. So right at the beginning, um, as we were crunching some numbers, we were also facing about $150,000 a month deficit, which was concerning for us. Um, and especially so early in the pandemic, this was before CARES Act. Um, this was before the community, oops, sorry, the community members like you all um, stepped up and, and you know, overwhelmed us with generous donations. So that was a little scary, but we, we firmly believe that that model was important, again, to keep everybody safe. Um, we also distributed those emergency boxes across our 14 counties to all of our partner agencies and food shelves. And this decision um, was really successful in the fact that a lot of these agencies and small food shelves in rural areas did not have the capacity um, or necessarily the staff to remain open in a safe way. So these food boxes for them were so important and um, we're proud as one of the six Minnesota Feeding America food banks in the state. We're the only ones that did not have any food shelves closed over the pandemic. And so we're very proud of that. And I think that is due to the fact that we made that decision very quickly and very early on to distribute this food in a safe way. Um, along with the pandemic um, became, became the school closings. So early on, that was a huge concern of ours. Um, what are these families and, and children going to do um, now that there are those meals that they depend on so heavily in schools have been taken away from them. Um, so right away we worked and within about a week um, of hearing that the schools were going to shut down, uh, we worked with the uh, Russian public schools to distribute about three times the amount of food that would normally go home with children on a Friday for them to take with them um, at, to at least help a little bit until we could get some more uh, distribution sites set up. So that was a huge win for us as well. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, April, May, um, we really learned quickly that partnerships were everything for us. Um, the, the number of partners that we've gained and worked with over the past 15 months have been incredible and invaluable. Um, some of those examples um, are Olmstead County. Um, they awarded us um, some money to supply these emergency boxes to social workers so that they could distribute to their clients and deliver them to their homes. Uh, we also provided food to the city through the Salvation Army for emergency homeless response. Uh, we also partnered with Power Ventures very early on to collect food from restaurants um, that they could not use in light of the pandemic. Um, and also Cradle to Career was a great resource right off the bat uh, as well to assist us with consistent community communications, resources for families and updates. Um, and that was again just the beginning. Um, Let's see here. I want to get off track here. Um, oh, of course, and then those partnerships grew into distributing these emergency boxes throughout Rochester. 
So that was another huge step. How do we get the food to the people who, can, who cannot come and get it? What we were hearing from families is, you know, parents are um, still trying to work and balance how they can be home for their children. Um, and a lot of times the time to come to Channel One um, was just not in the cards. Um, or kids could be home, you know, 16 year old children may be home um, and unable to um, get to the grocery store, but mom's not home. So how, how can these, these individuals come and get the food that they need? So working with uh, the city of Rochester, Family Service Rochester, Cradle to Career, the Rochester Public Library, and um, we all kind of partner for um, food distribution boxes um, in conjunction with Rochester Public Schools uh, family meal distributions. So may, you may have heard that uh, Rochester Public Schools did uh, distribute meal kits uh, for the children, um, and we kind of just partnered on that. If, if this is where families are coming to get the food, let's join them and get them the most food possible for their staffs. So again, partnerships there have been invaluable. Um, and then, of course, not only in Rochester, but we started doing that in our 14 communities as well. Um, we began having more uh, pop-up mobile distributions, um, and again, all across areas of our 14 county, uh, to make sure that those people who are out of jobs or um, having their income reduced uh, because of COVID um, have all they need um, as well. Um, so, so that was kind of the initial distribution response. It was, it was madness, it was a lot of work, but again, the partnerships were so strong and everybody was so willing to come together. Um, and, and I'm gonna back up a little bit, and I know I mentioned this $150,000 deficit. Um, we were very, very uh, grateful to receive some wonderful CARES Act uh, money to help us make that deficit go away. Um, as well as just an outstanding response from the community. Uh, businesses, individuals um, really stepped up to help support their neighbors. And I can't tell you how invaluable that has been um, to make sure that we didn't have to stop services anywhere. And in fact, it enabled us to even make our, set, our services better, which I'll, I'll get to as well. So um, around June of 2020, um, as our food shelf was closed and we were continuing to operate that drive-through model, it was an opportunity for us to really evaluate this program and how we're serving our communities. So we began partnerships with IMAA and the Diversity Council to plan some joint work um, and apply for a Feeding America grant that could transform and improve charitable food systems um, and rebuild and evolve our agency <coughs> networks. So we started partnering with them and there was a lot of work about identifying who our clients are, what it is they need, and, and how to serve them best. And this has been um, transformational, I think. You know, as we've been um, doing these, these trainings and this deep look, um, we realized that we needed to do a little bit better to, to serve the communities that are truly impacted um, by food insecurity. On the other page of your, um, of your one pager here, um, there's a little bit of information about what we have found out with this work um, and who's affected by it and, and, and what it is that they want. Um, one of the things that we found out is that um, the top five requested items um, are meat, poultry, fish, uh, fruits and vegetables, fresh of course, produce, milk and dairy, eggs and cooking supplies. Um, this is not really news to us because it's probably top five on all of our grocery lists, those items. So of course, why wouldn't it be on, on anyone else's as well? Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit because this ties in, I swear it's been a long year. So I apologize if I go back and forth a little bit. But um, during all this, we also did, decided to end food drives at Channel One. And some of you may have heard this um, or been impacted or seen that there's no more blue barrels sitting about, uh, about town. Um, and that originally was a strategic decision just for safety purposes. We wanted to really redu reduce the amount of contact with people, um, not encouraging people to congregate together. Um, and of course, back then we were supposed to wipe off all our groceries and leave them sit in the garage for you know a week before we brought them in the house. So we decided let's just not even mess with that. Um, and so we decided to discontinue. Um, but as, as time went on and we were evaluating our food systems and our food shelf and what it is we're providing for the community, we had a, a huge realization that these food drives um, were quite inefficient, actually. Um, we, we, we found out that the amount of time to, to pick up the food, sort the food, store the food, 
um, inventory the food, and then of course throw out food that is unusable um, was way higher than what we as Channel One have as bought in buying power as a food bank. Um, Channel One can purchase three and a half meals for every dollar donated to them. So again, the amount of food that we could purchase um, greatly outweighed the amount of time and money that we were spending on this donated food. Another um, reason to discontinue these food drives and go towards that um, purchase model is these top five food items that I just mentioned. Uh, meat, poultry, fish, again, fresh produce, dairy, eggs, cooking items. Most of these things cannot be donated in a food drive. Um, and as we're looking at the overall health of the community and those who are impacted by food insecurity, they have a higher risk of chronic health issues. So it's a really important for us to make sure that this food is, is nutritious and valuable to them. Um, a lot of times food drives um, and, and donated food can be high in sodium, preservatives, um, and really just not what they're looking for, um, which does not feel dignified um, or give them a sense of security. So a lot of these things shaped our, shaped our decision. Um, and what really essentially happened with all these findings is that we realized that we really needed to make a change in the food shelf. So in June of 2020, we got board approval to renovate our food shelf, which was a really exciting endeavor, but also scary because we were very busy at the time, just, just trying to kind of keep afloat. Um, but this, this decision has been transformational in how we serve our community. Um, we partnered with uh, something called Super Shelf, which is out of University of Minnesota Extension. It is a wonderful program that works with food shelves across Minnesota. Um, we also partnered with Crick Trip to get some consultation on retail setup and consumer behavior. Um, and really the goal with these two organizations was to make the healthy choice the easy choice. Has anyone been in the uh, Channel One Food Shelf pre-renovation? Uh, Fantastic. So you may remember it was, you know, just a, a basically a room um, and had some cooler space. But a, a lot of times it was just pallets of food kind of sitting in the middle uh, and people would have to dig through various assorted items uh, of, of hodgepodge and who knows what. Um, so really this model has been um, to make it a lot more like a grocery store setting. So because we're able to purchase those items, we are, a lot, we are able to have uh, amazing consistency for our shoppers. So they see the same things on the same shelves every time. Again, beautifully laid out like a super, uh, like a like a supermarket. Um, we always have fresh milk and dairy available, proteins. Those top five items have been a priority for us. They are always available at our food shelf, um, and and I think it's been really transformational as far as giving the shoppers a, a better experience and um, a dignified means to get their food. Um, so, <laughs> again, with I'm going to re realign myself here. Again, it's a lot of stuff that's been happening. So uh, I'm gonna go to October. So um, we reopened the food shelf in October. That's when the, the transformation was complete. Um, I believe it was very end of October, October 30th was our soft opening. Um, and also along the way, we um, changed our model of having people come once a month. Um, we realized that that just wasn't enough to keep families afloat and also not every time they come do they need to have a full shopping experience. Fresh produce, as we all know, only lasts about a week, um, to if we're lucky, um, the milk runs out. So we invited shoppers to come every week um, or as often as they needed. Um, and we lifted a lot of restrictions so that families felt that if they needed to just come back and restock on milk or produce, they were able to do that. <laughs> Um, so these transformations in the food shelf and, and reduced restrictions um, have has, has been what drove us to serve in the pre-pandemic about 25 households a month to that 4,000 average. Um, the response has been fantastic. People are loving it. They feel very welcome there. Um, again, been truly transformational. So that's probably one of the most exciting things that we've been up to, um, but there's been a lot more as well. Um, also in partnership with uh, the Foundation for Essential Needs, they really helped us to evaluate um, this transformation, but not just that, but making the realization that this super shelf model could be beneficial for all of our food shelves. And we are really looking to kind of lead the charge and be that example for other food shelves as well to do that diversity and inclusion work, 
um, civil rights training, super shelf training, um, choice models, all of those things which are extremely important to those that we serve. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, and, and that again, that was October. I'm going to back up a little bit more and talk about one of the other things that we have been up to. Um, and that was uh, beginning in August, we got a grant from the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, and we that grant was to offer prepared meals to uh, the public, and specifically school aged children and their families. So this grant was huge for us. And it was the first time that Channel One ever dealt with prepared meals in this capacity. So um, we contracted out to Powers Ventures to do these prepared meals, who also subcontracted um, some minority businesses to handle, uh, minority uh, owned catering businesses to handle our halal and Latinx meals as well. So we were very thoughtful about that. And with this prepared meals, um, initiative, we were able to produce uh, 83,830 meals to the Rochester uh, Olmstead County community. Um, and there was huge partnerships with that as well. We could not have done that without um, the help of our distribution sites. Um, and of course, Rochester Public Schools as well. Um, we ended up partnering with them at Graham Park, the uh, fairgrounds there, to do a joint distribution of their meal kits and our prepared meals. So again, we could get as much food to these families in one stop as possible and making it as, as convenient for them as we can. Um, so that prepared meals has been a great success. That initiative ended in December. Um, again, we got over 83,000 meals out of the community and realized that this is a fantastic opportunity and something that we wanted to continue to grow. Um, so based on that success, um, we started looking for other ways how we could continue our prepared meals. Um, we uh, ended up partnering and having some conversations with Second Harvest Heartland, which is the Minneapolis area food bank. Um, and they currently have a um, prepared meals program called the Minnesota Central Kitchen. Um, and it's a wonderful model um, that we decided to uh, adopt and implement with their partnership here in Rochester. We recently received a $20,000 grant from Walmart as well so that we could kick this partnership off. Um, and so we hope to get that rolling here soon. We're kind of just in the beginning works of that, but it's something we're really, really excited about uh, to be able to continue these prepared meals as we've seen a huge demand for it. Um, we also got a wonderful um, uh, grant from the um, um, Oh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I just looked at you for the know. answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to continue our work with Retail Rescue, which is another one, another way that we get our food. So we work with places like hy -Vee, um, Quick Trip, um, and a lot of other grocery stores to uh, rescue food that would otherwise be thrown away, but is still perfectly good, and get that also out to our uh, partner agencies. And this grant also will enable us to work with our agencies so that they can do that locally as well, um, increasing food rescue all across our service region. Um, let's see here. It's a lot. How am I doing? I'm going to leave some time for questions as well. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Can I use the mic? Yes, please. I can repeat your question as well if you, if you want to say where you're at. Okay. You know, we all last year we all well many of us saw the food lines nationally mile line. It was like you know, three miles, five miles, Texas, I think San Antonio went for ten miles. Mm -hmm. Um and I was just amazed, well maybe not amazed. Um, um are many Americans like two weeks away from food security? I think you're saying yes, they are. Yeah, so the question was, um, you know, nationally we saw a lot of coverage of food banks having lines uh, miles out lining up for this food. Um, and is the reality that many families in America are, are about a, a two week paycheck or uh, say an $800 uh, surprise emergency away from food insecurity? And, and unfortunately the answer is yes. Um, so many Americans live paycheck to paycheck, um, whereas something that uh, 800 or $1,000 surprise bill or emergency or anything um, could really put them into to food insecurity. Now, you know, being food insecure, you know, it, it ebbs and flows as well. So sometimes, you know, people could just be in food insecure a little bit more at the end of the month. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it does vary. So the answer shortly is yes. A, a lot of people um, 
that are considered food insecure don't even really realize it. They, they feel that it's normal to go ahead and make those, again, hard decisions between paying a bill um, or, or getting groceries. Or mothers, we, we've talked to our uh, shoppers where mothers will skip meals or they're watering down milk to stretch it um, with, for their children. So it's, it is real and yeah, it is unfortunately, that is a true fact. Um, and we did see some of those lines in Rochester as well, specifically at the Grand Park distributions. Um, those were from the buildings out around the block, definitely. Yeah. Can you talk about how you source uh, culturally relevant? Absolutely. Um, we purchase it, plain and simple. Again, as a food bank, Channel One has tremendous buying power. Um, so we 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 source it ourselves. So we have uh, we work with USDA and many food manufacturers. Um, a lot of this food, and I think that people may not realize it, is a lot of this food is allocated and set aside for food banks specifically. So we have that first time access. Um, and so when we are able to take the funds that people give us or the grants that we have, um, we can make those purchases um, without um, kind of disrupting the, the grocery market food chain and supply chain um, because it's already, it's already set there for us. So um, yeah, the, the short of it is we purchase it. Yeah, and it's very impressive, uh, overwhelming uh, reach that you have. Um, how many volunteers do you have? How many employees do you have? Sure, uh, we have about 29 uh, employees, uh, which is pretty small for 14 counties. And that includes, of course, drivers, warehouse programs, agencies, uh, my, my development communication team. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're all very busy little bees. Um, and then as far as volunteers, um, I wish I had a better answer for that. I mean, thousands, uh, but on an average, for example, in a day, um, we like to see probably about 20 to 25 volunteers come through each day, if that kind of gives you a sense of, of how many volunteers. Some of those are repeat volunteers, sometimes they're one off or they'll volunteer once a month, so that does vary. Um, but, and that's in our food shelf. That's our probably highest need for volunteers right now is in our food shelf um, to keep that running. Uh, specifically, since I mentioned, you know, how, how small our staff is, we rely heavily on volunteers to help us run that food shelf. Um, and it's, it's been really positive. The, the training that we have done um, and the models that we have changed, our volunteers are extremely on board and so welcoming to our shoppers. So volunteers have been invaluable. Any other questions right now? Several? Yes. I have a question. I think you answered part of it that you're no longer doing food drives like the Boy Scouts or mm -hmm. the mail carrier. Yes. Back in the days when you did that, was I used to go out and cut a deal at a grocery store and pile cases of stuff up on my mailbox. And so now, and I quit doing that while we were still doing it mm -hmm. because I would guess if I would send you $100, for example, you can buy a lot more than I can buy at the grocery store. Yes, sir, you are correct. And then it's stuff that you need. Yes, very true there as well. Um, yeah, food drives, um, not only is it, you know, not cost effective for the giver's impact, because as a, as a, a donor and somebody who wants to help an organization, it's probably very important to have your dollar the most utilized that it can be. So if we're um, having our donors going out there and purchasing food at retail prices, even maybe at a, a discount, may not even be uh, the, as close to the discount that we would get. And not only that, but you know, yes, unfortunately we did see the throwaway items um, and there's only so much you can do with pumpkin pie filling that's about to go bad. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, again, every dollar generates three and a half meals. So, um, whoever can go to the grocery store and produce three and a half meals for a dollar, I, I would love to hear it. So we're really proud of that buying power and, and really encourage it as well. So will you take donations of like produce? So like if <laughs> Produce is the only donation that we do accept. We um, encourage local growers or farmers um, if they have excess produce. We have a lot of uh, people who just love gardening and they'll plant extra rows for channel one. I mean, that is fantastic. Produce is invaluable and we will always take it. We've got people who bring in just tons of bushels of fresh kale from their garden and it literally goes directly to the food shelf and I've seen it disappear within an hour. So it's fantastic. It's probably picked and then gotten to these people within 
you know, a few hours, which is fantastic. Um, and on our website, if anyone, you know, has any questions on some of this information, it's there, who to contact and all that as well. Um, yes. I was going to ask about the kitchen because I was going to yes. a roster class that was now with our community tech project. How is that space being utilized? Very good question. I did not get to that, and I don't even think I put it in my notes. That is actually huge as well. There's been so much that it's, it's again, it's hard to kind of keep it all straight. But um, yeah, so the community kitchen has um, been, I, I think, a little underutilized, um, and, and not for lack of trying. Um, as we did these um, food shelf surveys, which again are on the back, um, of that there. One of the things that uh, we found by serving our clients, because uh, initially there was a lot of thoughts and plans for teaching kitchens and um, teaching our shoppers how to use the products that we're giving them. Um, but again, through the survey, we have found that they um, know how to, to cook the food. Um, and also, if you're a single mother with two jobs and kids at home, a cooking class is the last thing that you have time for. So um, unfortunately, that did not go off as, as, as well as we had hoped, but we put a lot of thought into how to use that space because it is a wonderful <coughs> space and extremely important to us. So we were able to do some minor renovations to the kitchen to make it much more commercial friendly. And this is a very new development. So starting in the next month or so, we're going to be promoting that as a place for the community to be able to rent out that space. Um, and again, we've consulted with um, some local chefs and caterers and um, to get the, the best possible setup for these businesses to use. So the target for that would be small startup businesses um, or uh, small minority businesses that may only have a cottage license for food. And what that means is they're very limited as to what they can make because it's out of their home. But when you have a commercial license, they were able to expand that business. <coughs> So that is kind of the direction that we're going with the kitchen. Uh, we are opening it up to the public for rent at a very, very reasonable fee. And for many groups, um, you know, depending on the situation, even waiving that fee. Our intention is to really create a, a, a community space so that no matter who's in our food shelf um, or in our food bank area, it feels like it's part of the community. There's a stigma around food shelves. Um, as you can imagine, it's very hard for people to come to our building in the first place. Um, so if there's anything that we can do to make them feel like, hey, no, it's everybody's coming here. We've got local businesses, we've got uh, community members, and this is just a space uh, for all things food in Rochester as well. So um, yeah, it's been an exciting endeavor and that'll be coming about as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Shopping that cost of food has gone up. Yes. Has that affected your buying power and what you're able to do? <coughs> uh, yes and no. Uh, the, the, the food chain supply has definitely ebbed and flowed throughout the past year. Um, our prices didn't, didn't necessarily go up, but um, the accessibility did get harder. The distribution got a little bit harder, um, relying on if the food was there or um, when it would get there, um, but for us, we were we were able to maintain those prices. Yes. Uh, first, just a friendly reminder: please repeat my question to the people on Zoom. That would be great. Oh yes, thank you. Sorry. No, that's okay. You're doing fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I am wondering what sorts of community outreach and communication Channel One is doing to reach families who don't know about you. That is a great question. So she wonders um, what we're doing to. Um, continue communications and outreach to those in our community who may not know about our services. Um, and that is definitely an ongoing struggle. I hear um, too often that people had no idea or maybe they thought that they wouldn't even come close to being eligible. Um, so, you know, we do our best to try to partner with a lot of different groups, especially social service groups uh, to help uh, get that message out to the community. Um, and, and anyone that we talk to in partnership, I think that's always one of the, the, the huge driving forces is to get that message out. Um, and then we, of course we do our best on, on news and any sort of media marketing that we can do. Um, but that's definitely been a struggle. Uh, it's something that we ask the community for help for all the time. Um, we have greatly reduced, again, not only the number of visits, but the eligibility. So um, eligibility is 300% of the poverty um, level, which is pretty generous. A lot of people um, qualify for the services. We do not check page stubs. This is on honor. If people are coming to the food shelf, that means that they need assistance. Um, and also, so, so we really don't turn anybody away. Um, 
Also, I think that um, a lot of our, who we serve are, are hardworking individuals who don't qualify for anything else. They make just a little bit too much money to receive SNAP um, or food stamps or other benefits. So they fall in this really unfortunate category that they make too much, but not enough. Um, so a lot of times I think the mentality is that they may not qualify or they don't deserve it. Or um, again, that's not for me, but it, it really is for everyone. It's, it's, I don't think we would ever, I can't even think of the circumstances where we would not let someone shop. Anyone all of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love all these questions. You guys are fantastic. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask my question. Go ahead. Was just, okay, what is 300 times the, the poverty? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, and it does vary uh, per household. I think it changes. Too. Yeah, it, it probably changes, but it, it is, he asked what is the, what is 300% of the poverty level? Um, the poverty rate is uh, for a family of four is $25,600. John lost us for the win. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Doug. <laughs> um, more at that table? Um, you, you said uh, three and a half meals per dollar. Mm -hmm. It means 25 cents per meal. How many calories? How many calories? <laughs> well, that sure depends. I'm hoping that if it's all fresh produce, very minimal, because that's what we love to get out of each other. Was there one more question over there? Yeah, my question is for the volunteering. So you say you have 1,000 volunteers, you, you know, and 25 a day or whatever. The clock, the order clock, just volunteer in the evening mm -hmm. before the pandemic. And then after that, it, it hasn't happened. Um, and the emails that come out, you're looking for volunteers during the day. Mm -hmm. So will we be able to get, be able to get back to volunteer in the evening? That's a great question. So his, his question was about um, evening volunteer opportunities and uh, probably group volunteer opportunities uh, as well, as which I'll, I'll loop into that. So um, along with a lot of these changes, um, we've had to adapt, um, and there has been a huge decline in group volunteering needs, unfortunately. Some of the reasons for that um, is the retail rescue, which dropped significantly um, during the pandemic because the grocery stores were using all their food or selling all their food. It greatly dropped. Um, what also has been dropping is manufacturer excess. Um, so what that means is manufacturer, and, and that, those are sometimes the donations we would get. Um, huge pallets of cereal or whatnot that we would have to repack because of, of excess manufacturing. Um, they have been really tightening their ships, and so that has also greatly reduced. Um, the supply chain has been more difficult, so we have a harder time knowing when we're going to get something. So to plan groups ahead of time has been challenging um, because if someone were to say, well, we'd like to come in, you know, August 17th at this time, we can't necessarily guarantee until, or we won't know even until that week of um, if we're going to have product or, or a project for them. So that's been really hard on us because we love having the groups in and something that we're internally working on. So it is my hope that we will be bringing that back as soon as we possibly can come up with a solution. Um, but uh, and, until then, I've been really appreciative of people shifting gears and considering the food shelf. The latest shift on that, unfortunately, is four to six. Um, so it kind of gets into the evening, um, but yeah, it is a lot of age shifts. Yes, back there. Well, it's obviously, obviously you depend upon a lot of volunteers. To what extent do you, do you encourage, or have you thought about encouraging those that to receive the food uh, to volunteer? And to what extent, if they do, do you have some programs to train them, participate, and be a part of? Yeah, absolutely. We are 100% open to that, and, and we do have uh, shoppers that are volunteers. Um, I think one of the um, important things that we've come brought out of the work with the IMAA and Diversity Council is um, how important representation is. And as we get into these communities and let them know that these resources are available, most of the time they're extremely excited to participate and, you know, represent their community who may be using the food shelf. So we have had great response. Um, and having that representation in the food shelf. And, um, and I think a lot of them, it makes them feel good about giving back as well as receiving. So, yes. Second question. Mm -hmm. It's well established that parents reading three children all the way from babies on up is one of the main contributors to their ability to learn. Do you or have you thought of children's books being part of K through 12 or kids' Yeah, so 
we did you um, his question is do we um, consider um, other areas of service for example providing books to young children um, and things like that and we have done that in the past um, in the um, previous food shelf model we did have children's books uh, that were available for people to take um, and we actually dealt with a lot of things non-food related um, and that was something that we've learned also going through uh, the pandemic and really trying to um, make everything extremely efficient um, is that we simply couldn't focus on too many things that weren't food. We wanted to do food and we wanted to do it well. Um, and, and at the level that we are trying to perform, um, we had to let go of some of those other service sectors. Um, but I completely agree with you, it's so important. I used to work for Boys and Girls Club, as you mentioned, and worked with John Lassness, um, and the early reading programs there are just so essential. So. I, I agree with you, but unfortunately, it's not something that we do at this time. There was some more. Fred, did you have a question? About five minutes, I suppose. You got like one more question. Okay. And that clock is slow. Okay. Um, so my second question then is, if we know a family or individual who we might think is food insecure, what is the first step that we can give them um, so that they can take action? Yeah, so her question was, if they do uh, know a family who may be facing food insecurity, um, what is the first step and, and um, how can we get them the, the food that they need? So I think that's a great question and I think it does start with communication um, to first of all, let them know that the services are there and they are 100% eligible for them. Um, I think another step is kind of breaking down that stigma that it's a shameful thing. This food is there. We have an abundance of food in this country and in the state. Um, and we have it, it's fresh, it's wonderful, and, and everyone is entitled to it and no one should have to go without. Um, and the next step I think is just really being a, a friend. If you, if you really do know them, um, help them overcome that stigma by possibly going with them or just doing a visit um, and making them feel comfortable even setting foot in the building. Because once they're there um, and have that first experience, I think is the biggest hurdle that we can get them over. Um, and once they have been there, they can feel a little bit more comfortable in coming back. Thank, you, Thank you all so much. <laughs> Is there a website volunteer donate? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica. As we close out today, I want to thank all who assisted. Paul T. Scotter, our greeter. Uh, Colin, who Colin Ellis, who Paul provided the reflection. Uh, John Woodruff at the visitor table and our sergeant at arms and a special thanks to our speaker, Jessica Sun. Thank you all, serve to change lives. We are adjourned.